Hello and welcome to Filling the Sink, a podcast from Catalan News. My name is Leah Villaiva, and today we're talking about assisted reproduction. Last week on Filling the Sink, we aired the first of two episodes on assisted reproduction. We explained the basics of the different methods of fertility treatment available in Spain and in Catalonia. We talked about fertility rates, and we had the absolute pleasure of speaking to pioneering doctor Ana Vega, who led the medical team that brought about the first IVF baby in all of Spain 40 years ago. And lastly, we spoke with the medical director Federica Mofa of Fertilab about reproductive tourism. On today's episode, we will talk to four women who have all had assisted reproduction treatment. We will explore topics such as breaking the taboo of infertility, the process of fertility treatment, new family structures, and much, much more. And once again, I have the pleasure of being joined by Killian Shields. Pleasure's all mine, Leah. Hello, hello. <laughs> hello again. And let's just start with a quick recap for those who haven't listened to the previous episode yet. What is assisted reproduction? So boils down, assisted reproduction is basically helping people who need help to have a family. This takes the form of various different processes. So there's freezing the eggs or the semen. There's IVF, in vitro fertilization, which is probably one of the most common, one of the most heard about processes involved. There's also artificial insemination. There's the ropa method, which involves IVF, but among queer couples where one of them gives the egg to the other to carry the baby. And there's also the use of fertility medication, for example, which can be used to stimulate ovulation. It is estimated that one in every 10 children are born thanks to assisted reproduction in Spain. And despite the number growing year after year, there's still a lot of stigma surrounding getting fertility treatment and infertility in general. Yes, precisely. According to the World Health Organization, around 17% of the adult population around the world suffer from infertility, which is defined as a disease where the male or female reproductive system doesn't manage to achieve a pregnancy after 12 months of trying or more. And Montserrat, who is 37 years old, is now pregnant with her first child through an egg donor after having gone through multiple rounds of IVF that all resulted in miscarriages. She explains that it's important for her to share her story with infertility, partially because some people don't treat infertility as a disease, but almost as a luxury problem not to be taken seriously. I think the topic of fertility treatment needs more attention, because it's still frowned upon, especially by older people. And people don't understand how long and painful the process is. After two miscarriages after IVF, I entered a deep depression. It was a very painful time. When Paula, aged 40 and currently expecting to be a single mother to her first child after a long road of failed IVF processes, got the news that she was infertile while in an abusive relationship, she felt very alone and, in her own words, deeply defective. It was hard getting the news that I was clinically infertile. I felt alone and had a lot of shame and guilt. I started looking for stories. I needed them about people who were infertile and who spoke about it. There were so few because there was a lot of shame. Montserrat says that one of the problems that creates a vicious cycle of stigma and taboo is that people tend to only talk about the positive things about a pregnancy. Everyone talks about becoming a mother, like it's easy. I had a child, I became pregnant, I gave birth, and that's it. We never talked about how complicated it is to get pregnant, give birth the postpartum period, breastfeeding. We have to talk about it, because when we talk about it, we support the person who's going through it. Grief is something that we do in silence, but we should be able to do it publicly. We are not educated to say, this is going on in my life, or I've suffered a loss, or a miscarriage. So we have to go through it alone, or at most with one or two people, and crying behind closed doors. But I can't do that. And for me, talking about it has been a gradual process. I spoke about assisted reproduction, but not about infertility, because it was very difficult for me. But now, after I started talking about it, people are also sharing their stories with me. Yes. 
for Violetta, who is 38 and has a 17-month-old child after doing IVF, it's also important to talk about men's infertility. For a couple of years, she and her partner had tried conceiving naturally without any luck before finding out that her partner had a low sperm count. There's not that much talk about the men's role in this. And I think, I remember in the first test when we had results from my partner, the doctor saying this is incredibly common. It's incredibly common that sperm count is really low and you know about how his own habits um, could influence in um, the sperm quality, the quality of the sperm. In general, 7% of the male population suffers from infertility and overall male infertility contributes to around half of all cases. Additionally, studies show that the average sperm count globally has been falling by 1.2% per year between 1973 and 2018 and that the rate of decline has increased in the last 25 years attributed to environmental and lifestyle factors. In the last episode of Filling the Sink, we mentioned that fertility rates worldwide are down, that people are just generally having fewer kids than before, and that now there's talk of structural infertility, which is basically people deciding not to have children for socioeconomic reasons. The mothers that we talked to all mentioned that money played a role in them deciding to have kids, both in terms of the price of fertility treatment, but also as the cost of raising a child in general. I think becoming a mother has become a class issue because if you don't have the money, it's very difficult to move forward with pregnancy and then raise a child. First of all, life is expensive, rent prices are through the roof, kindergarten... This is Marta, she's 41 years old and did IVF after having frozen her eggs at 35. When you decide you want to become a mother, I think the next question you ask yourself is, how will I make it to the end of the month? And depending on the answer, you think about it. Because being a mother is hard. It's incredible, but it's hard. And if you add economic hardship to that, it's three times as hard. Marta adds, however, that her reason for waiting until later to have kids wasn't primarily because of money, but that she wasn't ready yet. When I decided to freeze my eggs at 35, it wasn't because I thought that at that stage of my life I couldn't afford to have a child. It was because I didn't think I was mentally or emotionally ready. So I decided not to get pregnant and wait. It's true though that the costs of living are hard and at 35, depending on what job you have, you could be in a very precarious position. I think our quality of life has reduced too. Our parents at the age of 25 didn't have the same situation as us at 25. And things have gotten a lot worse now. We are the first generation that will be worse off than our parents. Violetta's case was similar. Probably at 30, I would have, like, no way would have wanted to be pregnant. Becoming a mother implies many amazing things but it also means leading a different kind of life so but yeah probably if i would have been aware to what extent it could have become hard then maybe i would have decided of maybe freezing some ovules but i probably wouldn't have been able to afford it at that stage so i don't know the cost of fertility treatment through the private system can also be a factor that prevents some people from having kids. In the private sector, procedures can cost anywhere from 600 euros for artificial insemination to more than 5,000 euros for one IVF cycle if you don't have insurance. And those numbers are even on the lower end of the scale. We had to choose between buying a house and having a baby. We spent all the money we had for a down payment. And when you decide that you want to become a mother, and if you can, you spend all the money you have to become one. All of the women that we spoke to had done fertility treatment in the private sector. And although there are no numbers on how many people seek treatment in the public versus the private healthcare systems or clinics, the fact is that only around 10 to 20% of fertility clinics in Spain are public. And one of the main reasons why the women sought assisted reproduction in the private sector, aside from the economic means, was to avoid wait lists. I went through the private system because the little information I had from the start about the public system was that there was at least a two-year wait for you to actually start the process and then that would take another time. 
it was basically a time that um, you know we'd been already trying for a couple of years and we were lucky enough to have the uh, money to do it privately and I didn't know I still don't think I know anybody who's gone in the public way not only is there a wait list, but also an age limit of 40 years for women. And not all procedures are included in the public offer, such as the ROPA method, reception of oocytes from the partner. And if a person already has children, they can't get public reproductive assistance. And up until 2016, single women or queer couples also couldn't get help at all in the public system, as the law only applied to straight couples. The road to parenthood is not only costly in many cases, for some people the possible road to pregnancy can also be very long, and this was the case for Montserrat. My story begins when I was 26 years old, when I suddenly stopped getting my period. I worried a lot about whether I at some point could get pregnant, so I went to different gynecologists. The public gynecologists performed different tests, but didn't find anything wrong. Instead. They told me that whenever I wanted to have a baby, I would just have to take a pill that would make my period come back, and then I would have a baby. They led me to believe that it would all be very easy. Montserrat ended up miscarrying three times in the first trimester, all after IVF, and is now 31 weeks pregnant as she speaks with us. It's a process that wears you out a lot, because it's something that you want a lot, and as more and more time passes, you will do anything to get there. Violeta's child is now 17 months old, but she assures that disappointment and frustration were also part of her process. In my case, luckily, everything has gone really well. It is, you are so happy, and from then on, it's all so normal. Normal. That's so, you know, similar to any other pregnancy that you forget, you tend to forget about it. And I know this is probably one of the hardest things I ever did in my life. And, you know, and you have to put injections in your stomach for a long time and you have to wait on lots of news from uh, lots of very intense phone calls and probably the bad phone calls that I got, I got like a couple of, of bad phone calls telling me when I wasn't pregnant, I'm incredibly sad and hard and hard and you know you've been through all this you spent all this money and it, you've put so much into it emotionally and it hasn't gone and then you think i might not be able to get it done but when you become pregnant and although there may be an element of a bit more nervousness than people that have done it naturally or that haven't had put so much into it you tend to forget or at least you know it the the happiness um replaces the the previous nervousness Paula believes that people who have suffered miscarriages shouldn't be thought of as any less of a parent. A lot of miscarriages happen and we have to include them in the same process of having a child. And mother and fatherhood doesn't always result with a baby. And when you try for years to get pregnant, you're already in the process of parenthood. It's as if the failed attempts weren't part of the same process. And I think they are. And also part of the many things that we keep private, like grief, experiences, and the whole reproductive process. In Spain, the percentage of IVF procedures with own eggs that result in the birth of a child are between 12 and 34 percent. The age of the person carrying the child greatly influences the chances of success, with rates significantly lower over the age of 40. With egg donations, the percentage is higher, between 43 and 46 percent. However, the figures clinics display prominently on their websites are usually far higher than this, as they typically publish data on the success rate of the survival of the embryo after the initial stage, normally up to five days, not a pregnancy that has come to term. Violeta points out that a lot of work goes into the pregnancy before the actual pregnancy begins. I think one of the main differences is that the pregnancy seems much longer because you've been <laughs> you've been working on it for longer. So you know when the nine months actually starts, you've already had a few months behind you of working on that. Despite the ups and downs, high costs and sacrifices, through assisted reproduction, two of the women were able to have children, while the other two are getting closer to their due date. I'm so thankful for that person who donated an egg because I can become a mom. 
I spent three days thinking that my daughter wouldn't look like me and wouldn't have my features, because what I really wanted was to be a mother. So I didn't grieve or anything, because I wanted so much to have a child that it didn't matter if someone else gave it to me. I was just grateful that they did, because without her, I could have never been a mother. I'll be eternally grateful. Science has given us a very powerful choice because it is a power to be able to choose if we want or don't want to become parents. This is a huge power because it lets us start families that break from the heteronormal structure of father, mother, child. And this is very interesting because that structure doesn't always work and it's not the only structure. Marta had decided to have a child on her own, but after her ex-girlfriend had been part of the birth and subsequently the first couple of months, they decided to co-parent without being in a romantic relationship and raise their son together as a new kind of family. I think family shouldn't be how we have been told they ought to be. For me, a family is a group of people who take care and love each other. It can be a group of two, of three, of twenty, who says that a family can be two people who love each other but don't have a sexual relationship and can be a role model to Martí. And I think it's beautiful. Although it's obviously not easy, it is a lot of work and therapy. Likewise for Paula, becoming a single mother thanks to assisted reproduction is a way of breaking stereotypes of what a family should look like. I love the subversive potential of assisted reproduction when it comes to the traditional type of family. Yes, I agree with a lot of the criticism that says that fertility treatment has been commodified. But the subversive potential is the dismantling of the idea that patroniality and the heteropatriarchy must control where every child comes from. And must control women through fidelity and submission to a man and control his genetic lineage. Assisted reproduction blows all that to pieces. Once I became pregnant, the first thing they ask you is, whose is it? Who is to blame? I didn't know you had a partner. First, everyone thinks of a man, and then everyone thinks about a couple, right? I respond directly because I think we have to break these barriers. <laughs> Although the women we talk to applaud the options provided by IVF, a recurring theme you hear when discussing fertility treatment is the million euro industry that makes it all possible. In 2023, the little over 300 private clinics and hospitals in Spain made 630 million euros on fertility treatment, which was a 5% increase on 2022. Something that you often hear is that some women and people who seek out fertility treatment feel like a number instead of a real person. If you manage to get pregnant through the public system, great. But if they don't accept you because of age, you have to go and pay for it, and it's expensive. I'm not saying it should be cheap, but there's a whole business side to it. I was very lucky, and I also have, I am privileged, because I can economically support this. And emotionally, for example, before I started, I thought it would be much harder for me, and it wasn't. Montserrat decided to change clinic after the first couple of failed IVF attempts because she didn't feel like the clinic treated her well. It would be a different doctor every time. They never remembered our medical record and everything was just very impersonal. And when you're going through a process like this one, with a lot of medication, stress, two miscarriages, two operations, I was actually very depressed and I was seeing a psychologist. It was a very painful period in my life. The clinics and the doctors abandon you through the hormone process and the process you have to follow to get pregnant. They do the in vitro or the transfer and suddenly there's silence for two weeks where no one tells you anything. You just wait. But the silence is awful. After months of noise, suddenly there's no one there, no one to call and ask how you are and it makes you nervous. When it comes to assisted reproduction, all the women agree that there's still so much more that we as a society need to know and learn from how our bodies work to the hardships of fertility treatment. I would also give thought of 
how much information women have about their own body. I have learned so much about how it actually works and I still have thousands of doubts of how my period works and, and I'm 38 and when you become pregnant, you kind of, okay, you have to be in contact with your body and you actually learn how it works. But it's just the fact that it has to become at that stage in life, I think is, is not good. For those who want to have fertility treatment, I want you to be prepared psychologically and have a great support system because it's really hard both on the person who's pregnant, but also the partner. And I think that this whole process will either make or break the couple. And people should do research on the clinic, because it's a business and there are so many clinics, and all of them will treat you differently. For Marta and Paula, expanding our understanding of who gets assisted reproduction and what a family can look like is important. I think it's good for information to be out there, to explain that assisted reproduction exists, to explain that it's not only for people who have fertility problems, but also for those who simply want to become a mother. This option exists. As her due date approaches, Paula is excited to begin a new phase of her life that she never thought she wanted, made possible thanks to IVF. Suddenly, at the most unexpected moment, and planning the last embryo for me is the culmination of this process. And now I'm at 36 weeks. I'm happy. <laughs> Thanks so much to Paula, Violeta, Marta and Montserrat for sharing their stories with us. And now it's time for the Catalan phrase of the week. What is it this week, Killian? This week we've got a poc a poc i amb bona lletra. A poc a poc i amb bona lletra. And what does that mean? So, I mean, literally, it would be uh, little by little and with good handwriting. That's, that's <laughs> word for word what the, what the refrain uh, translates to. Uh, but what does it mean in reality? It means that things should be done not hastily, but with caution, with good time, slowly, carefully, so that they turn out well in the end. Aha, a poc a poc y en bona lletra. And that's all we have time for today. Thanks for listening. Please do subscribe to Filling the Sink wherever you get your podcast if you haven't already. Thanks to you, Killian. Thanks very much for having me. And we'll be back again next Saturday with another episode of Filling the Sink about the Barcelona Pride. On behalf of the team here at Catalan News, I'm Lea Bilaiva, wishing you a great weekend. Fins aviat. Adeu.